Welcome to the Booktopia podcast, a podcast about books and the fantastic people who read them and write them. I'm Ben Hunter, Booktopia's fiction category manager, and my guest today has written one of the most riveting new Australian novels of the year. Kate Mildenhall is the author of Skylarking, the co-host of the First Time podcast, and her second book, which is about to knock your socks off, is called The Mother Fault. She she uh, is joining me now over Skype. Uh, as we remain housebound, but uh, thankful to be alive. Kate, welcome to the Booktopia podcast. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. It is indeed nice to be alive, a little annoying to be housebound, but that's okay. Yeah, how are you getting on, like, just really, uh, every day? <laughs> well, I am uh, spending a lot of time baking bribes for my children, and um, and there's a lot of screen time, Uh but aside from that, I am trying to get them involved in, in book promotion, get them a little bit excited about helping me <laughs> make videos and the rest. Um, you know, we're very lucky to live where we we live kind of on the outskirts of Melbourne. So we've got a little bit of space where we are, which is uh, something I am eternally grateful for. So just kind of hanging in there in this state of disaster. Good. Good to know. Um, there's a lot of excitement around your new novel. Uh, your debut came out a few years back. It won the, uh, or what didn't win, it was, it was uh, long listed for the Voss Literary Prize in 2017. Uh, it was a historical novel um, called Skylarking, uh, but this new novel takes us into Australia's future. Um, would you care to describe it and maybe scare our pants off a little bit? <laughs> I did go as far as possible as I could away from uh, historical fiction, didn't I? So The Mother Fault is the story of Mim. Uh, she's a mother. She's um, been at home raising kids for a time. And her husband, uh, when the book opens, has gone missing from an Indonesian mine site. And when Mim tries to work out where he is and she talks to the department, who are the kind of all-encompassing government body who now run Australia... Uh, they uh, threaten to take her kids away from her if she doesn't stop asking questions. So like any uh, any kind of good mother, she uh, doesn't listen and she she flees with her kids uh, in in what becomes and has to make an increasingly increasingly difficult decisions to try and keep them safe. So it's a little bit of a road novel, Ben. It's also a sailing adventure and a bit of a love story, a bit of kind of political intrigue in there, uh, kind of all those things wrapped up in one. I wanted to make it as uh, as big and as crazy as I could. And the concept of the department and the future um, post-warming that you cast Australia in is terrifying. Um, when did that, that come to you? Well, before this year, obviously, and it's been a little bit frightening, I must admit, even reading back over some of the kind of um, the government speak and the bureaucracy that, that Mim has to deal with and listening to the same kind of talk, um, you know, coming out in our, our news bulletins at the moment. Um, so the the future was really I wanted to press it forward, but just a little bit in time. And I know that so many writers talk about how hard this is. I've heard James Bradley and, and Jane Rawson both talk about, you know, kind of 20, 10, 20 years in the future is the hardest time to write because things happen like pandemics come in and, you know, throw everything out. But um, I did really want to go on that, that kind of Margaret Atwood idea of making sure that the things that I included in this future had had precedence in the world already so the idea of the surveillance i read a lot on on what happens in um china particularly to the uyghur people i read about how governments use disappearance um you know a lot of that stuff it came from came from research so i wanted to make sure it at all it, it was likely that it was going to happen and it feels increasingly uh increasingly so yes, yes. and you you feel that reading um absolutely um, I love the character of Mim. She's awesome. Um, she's imperfect, but she's uh, uh, just so so um, lovable. You just root for her the whole time. Um, you are a parent, Kate. Um, were you a writer first? And if so, uh, how has motherhood um, changed your work? Not just in a practical sense, but 
as an influence on on what motivates you to tell stories? That is such a good question, Ben, and almost makes me cry that idea of you asking, um, was I a writer first? Because I've actually written in the um, acknowledgements of the mother fault to my daughters to thank them for recognising that I am their mother and a writer both because the two don't necessarily go together and anyone who's listening who's a mother particularly or a parent or caring for people will know that the two sometimes feel mutually exclusive in terms of time and energy and and space. Um, I started writing Skylarking or I, I, I came back to writing after a long absence when my kids were, were really young um, and it was partly this kind of urgent need to get words down on the page that took me back to studying and to what eventually became Skylarking. This book is very much about the the experience of motherhood and, uh, you know, it, it, of, of course it draws on my own experiences but more than that on the experiences of lots of my friends and, and women that I read about uh, and the way in which they are torn every day. Uh, I, I think people can recognise that even more so now when we're, we're all kind of, so many of us are housebound with our kids. But but where it started really for me, Ben, was watching um, four years ago, watching kind of refugees and asylum seekers arriving in Australia and all around the world who were doing um, desperate kind of journeys to keep themselves and their kids safe. And asking those questions, of course, we all ask, which is what would I do to keep my kids safe and what would I do in that situation? At the same time, as as and being as frank with you as I possibly can, that some days I wanted to chuck my kids in the rubbish bin or ask someone else to come and look after them because I felt incapable of, of doing so. Um, so it was those two, the, the tension between those two ideas, how we can um, know that we would do anything to protect our kids at the same time as, um, you know, they, they send us mad. <laughs> That's really neatly put. Um, this is a, a thrilling story. Uh, it sucks you in and demands your attention. Um, and you, you read just chapter after chapter. Um, uh, but as you allude to it, it's, it's also really personal. It's really insular. Um, Mim doesn't know what's happened with her husband um, when everything uh, goes to heck, um, and she, she for a lot of the book she she doesn't really know if she has a chance of seeing him again at all, or even if she's going to remain safe for the next twenty four hours. It's that kind of heart palpitating story, uh, and that remains constant right through. Uh, how did the how did you craft this story together? Did it um, reveal itself as a neat small um, story with a, a bigger complex? problem in your imagination did it did it sort of grow out of a smaller book a, a, oh, a larger book uh it nearly defeated me is is what it nearly did ben it, it had uh so many iterations this mm. book uh at one particular time i i was very lucky to do a, a mentorship during the writing of this book with charlotte wood and uh, at one time she said look why don't you try retyping retyping the thing i had I had, you know, 60 or 70,000 words. And she talked about the idea that, that in retyping it, you would find um, what had the energy and, and what needed to remain. Anything that you couldn't be bothered retyping had to go. So, you know, I've, I've done a, a lot of work and it, and it really changed. And at some points I thought that that, I thought it was too smart for me, Ben. Like I was like, I've written myself into a corner. You know, I don't, I have no background in geology. I don't, I didn't understand some of the stuff I was writing about and I had to keep researching and researching. So um, in terms of that, it, it, it really nearly did ref, uh, defeat me and it certainly wasn't neat at all. What I knew was that I am a massive fan of, of all types of books. Um, I'm also a fan for big end of the world apocalyptic kind of movies, you know, Armageddon, those, those kinds of things, right? And for a long time, I thought that I was not allowed to write, you know, a, a literary book that kind of felt a bit like Armageddon. <laughs> that, that just wasn't, you know, that there's rules around these things and I, I wasn't allowed to do that. So it took me a long time to free myself up to work out that I could try and make this big, thrilling kind of page turner of a book about this small 
the small domestic realities of this woman and that she still has to care about school pickup and making sure, you know, worries that the kids are having too much screen time when she's trying to escape the country. So, you know, I wanted to put those kind of things together and um, I love that you say that it's that it's a page turner because that means that I that I succeeded at least in that part. Undoubtedly. <laughs> um, I, I'm fascinated that you had Charlotte Wood involved as a as a mentor, as an early reader, um, because I, I can I can see a, a neat and tidy parallel between uh, her book, The Natural Way of Things and and yours. I could also see um, a little bit of uh, Heather Rose's Bruni in the kind of contemporary Australian political world and how that can play out in the imagination, how that can play out in, in fiction or, or even the sort of ap- <laughs> apocalypse movie yeah. fiction, if, if you put it that way. Absolutely. You know, um, I actually I actually contacted Charlotte first uh, because of the similarities. I, I heard her in, in the way that she talked about knowing what the material of the natural way of things was but not being sure how to approach it and being kind of overwhelmed by the way that she came upon in the end. And and I felt such affinity with that at the point that I, I knew I was writing this story about a mother who I knew had to leave Australia by boat and I wanted it to be <laughs> a dystopian political eco-thriller kind of thing. Um, and so it was just pure luck really that she – was open at that time for a mentorship and we worked together um, over about a year and she she did a, an assessment of the manuscript. And, and we also just talked through some of those, some of the big ideas and the big knots that, that writers get themselves in. But mostly I have to say she talked to me about confidence and about owning the book that I wanted to write, even in the face of... Um, some of the some of the quite big hurdles that it came up against in in making sure that it got out to the world and and so I have absolutely have her to thank to thank for that. How's the process um, of writing this one differed from the process behind Skylarking? Oh, Skylarking was a gift. <laughs> Skylarking was an absolute gift. It was. I didn't know how to write a novel. I didn't know how not to write a novel. I didn't even realise I was writing a novel. It was based on a true story, so I had all the, the the whole skeleton of the plot was already done for me. I wrote it during um, my time at RMIT, so in a novel writing class where I was getting feedback every week from readers who were invested, uh, and it was picked up by a publisher before I'd finished. So it was, you know, even wow. I laugh at myself now and think, what, <laughs> you know, what a absolute dream run I had with the writing of that. And, and I think obviously, you know, everyone talks about second novels. I, I wanted, I really deliberately wanted to do something different this time. I didn't want people to think uh, that I could only produce or was only going to produce historical fiction. Um, hilariously, I'm going back to historical fiction again for my third, but Great. I, I, you know, I, I really wanted to, um, yeah, I, I really wanted to kind of, push myself with this but the blank canvas is terrifying just being able to make up what happens to characters utterly blew my mind and certainly um yeah I got I got myself in a, in a couple of knots uh, along the way so it, it took much longer um it took much longer and it, it took a lot out of me but I'm so I'm so pleased thrilled really with um that I kind of pushed it as far as I possibly could and and that it's it's coming out in the world, which at, at times I didn't think was going to happen. I'm going to ask a question about um, hairy politicalness. Um, oh. And I understand that, you know, you, you work in fiction um, and you don't have to have opinions on absolutely everything. Um, but I, I feel inspired to ask this based off of the, the power of what you've written and how um, frightening and real it feels. Uh, why do you think Australia today is flirting with authoritarianism and how slippery is the slope that slides into the future that you've imagined? Oh, it's a great question and 
I think it is very slippery. And, you know, though, even in the past couple of months, I've suddenly realised how careful I need to be in talking about this because what I originally wanted to write was a book that asked people to to pay attention. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I've used it, the epigraph is from um, from a Netflix documentary, you know, and it, it's about people not reading the terms and conditions. And and so I suppose I, I don't have any answers for anything, but what I was asking people to do was to just pay attention to that slippery slope that we're on. What I don't want people to do is to come up with, you know, half-cocked conspiracy theories about... <laughs> about what the what governments are doing. So I think, you know, I think it's all part of the same problem, which which we have very little room these days for grey area um, and and the subtleties that there are between extremes. And so suddenly I really am waking up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, my gosh, what if people think that I'm like an anti-masker kind of alt-right weirdo for writing this book? And uh, I'm not that at all. <laughs> But I still think that it's okay for us to question and to continually question the people who are in power in our countries. That's our job as citizens. That's what we should do. Absolutely. Um, what do you want to achieve with the book beyond just fame and adoration and <laughs> obscene wealth, which will well, be coming naturally? Obviously, all I wanted to achieve was to get to Booktopia and sign my name on the damn table, which this pandemic has put a stop to. But, oh, man. Uh, <laughs> what, I, what I really wanted to do was to get the monkey off my back, to get the second novel off my back. You know, at, at times I remember halfway through the writing of this and I, for the first time, I, I read a book by um, Louise Erdick, I think that's how you pronounce her name, and... I was flipping through the front as writers do and I was like, I can't believe I'm reading this woman for the first time now and she's written all these other books and she's clearly got all these other books ahead of her and it was the first time I really understood um, how much, how many books I've got in me and how many I want to get down. So there was this this point where I was like, oh, my gosh, just let this damn thing be done. Let me get on to my next one. Um, I really do, I've come to think of it much more as an apprenticeship, this writing gig, and, you know, have great faith in the idea that that there are more books ahead and and the ambition for what those can be. Um, so in terms of that personally as a writer, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted the damn thing to be done. But I do hope that I mean, we always hope for kind of big feels from our readers. What what has been astonishing and deeply gratifying has been some early reader responses, particularly from people who are mums, who have felt really seen in the book. And um, you know, I think I think we talked we talk about we talk about how hard it is to be a parent and to have young kids all the time. There's, there's, there's lots of talk about that, but we, we still don't see kind of all the, all the back end of that all the time. You know, we have little moments on Instagram where we say, oh, I was such a bad mum today, but then the next time you've got, you know, cuddles and, and baking and flowers and the rest of it. So I think to stay with a character while she, makes mistakes and um and big mistakes and and questions herself so deeply uh i really hope that that readers enjoy that experience i think that's definitely going to connect um can i talk now with you a little bit about your podcast um you can. the first time podcast uh uh when did that kick off uh and how has it been an influence on your writing ah so it kicked off it kicked off when um, my dear friend Catherine was about to publish her fabulous book, uh, debut book, The Helpline, um, which was in two th 2018 or, or coming into 2018. And, you know, it, we were kind of laughing about that idea that she would ask me these questions like, oh, well, what do I do now? Or, what do you mean you send 
flowers to your publisher on publication day or, you know, how do you do a launch? All these random questions, which which aren't necessarily the big questions that there's articles written about or, you know, like how to pitch to an agent and all the rest of it. These were like these nitty-gritty questions. So um, we were, we'd were we both been interested in the idea of uh, a podcast and we both quite enjoy a chat. And so we started there. We did not, you know, we had to beg people at the start, <laughs> like these emails that we sent out, excuse me, could you please, please be on our podcast? Um that kind of thing and and you know now it's it's delightful we've got publishers asking us um and and we've got more people wanting to be on the podcast than we than we possibly could could fit in um what's it taught me oh my goodness Ben! like every single conversation with with a writer has has taught me something different I'm constantly blown away by the breadth of experience and the the numerous ways people get to to where they get to and mm-hmm. I suppose you know at, at the end of we're in season three now I think we've got 80 80 episodes or something up um that you know there's no wrong way to do it is is what I've is what I've come to there are no rules you can do whatever you want um and I think I've been struck or and we both are Catherine and I talk about this all the time with with people's honesty and frankness and generosity, writers in in sharing their experiences and also the opportunity to talk outside of their their PR time. So obviously we do a little bit of both because you know we, when people have books out, that's when they're available uh, to talk to someone like Kate Grenville, who I you know was gagging to speak to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you only get that chance when she's in promotional phase, but it's also really important to us to talk to writers when they're not in that phase, which is something that Charlotte Wood did in her amazing book, The Writer's Room, Um, to get those other emotions as well, to get the moments when you are in a trough and there's rejection or, you know, your agent stopped calling or all those other things that happen to writers uh, along the way. Yeah, and certainly the, the, um, the first few weeks right after publication are a, are a bit of a bubble a, a bubble you know yeah. the the publication cycle the uh, the press um that's really fascinating that you talk to people outside of that 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 period um who have you uh um enjoyed having on the most who, who, who's been some highlight guests oh my goodness well um you know obviously Grenville was a a huge delight for myself personally um I'm going to say, and only because I just caught him last night as part of Canberra Writers Festival, that speaking to Chris Flynn was really delightful, partly because his take on on everything was so different to other writers. So sometimes when you get one right out of the box like that, so he he wrote Mammoth, um, just, just completely different take. Um, some of the ones that have been most special to me are also talking to people who are my friends. So recently I interviewed Zana Freilon, whose new book, The Lost Soul At- Atlas, is is just out. And you realise that you've never asked the questions that you take the time to ask in an interview as well. Um, and so that's been something that's really quite amazing to realise too when you, when you see that. One of the most listened to episodes is still... Um, Claire G. Coleman, who we interviewed, who, who who was our first first ever guest, and who was utterly fantastic, and it's it's a joy to to watch her success as well. Mm. What a star! Uh, how frequently are you dropping um, new episodes, and where can people listen? Okay, so go to uh, our website, which is thefirsttimepodcast dot com, or uh, the first time podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And uh, at the moment, we're fortnightly with our uh, guest interviews, but we've also got this amazing series. I don't know if you've heard uh, our conversations with friends series, which we did as kind of our little, our little um, light against the, the darkness of, of COVID nineteen, which is writing friends in conversation. So we just intro them, they send in their own conversation. We've got no part in any of that, and we're dropping them every week at the moment. So there's been some fabulous duos. Um, Jane Harper was on with Karina Kilmore. We've had Fable Parrot talk to Sarah Schmidt. Um, Angus Harvey, who does the Future Crunch um, newsletter, and McKinley Valentine. So really diverse kind of um, 
groups of friends chatting about the writing process and they're out weekly at the moment. That's so cool. Um, I'm running out of time. I, I want to mention quickly how jaw-droppingly amazing the cover of this um, new novel is. Oh, my goodness. Um, and you have a face mask made in its honour. I do. It only arrived yesterday. It is the most beautiful thing. And now that I've spent some time looking at it, this was made by Liz Murphy, who's at Simon & Schuster, just out of her own dear good heart. Um, and I had no idea it was coming. And she's done it just beautifully. There's little tucks and uh, it's it's sewn just absolutely delightfully. Uh, the cover of this book blew my mind and I don't know if you've heard the story but when um when I signed the deal with Simon and Schuster I was on a trip around Australia with my family so this was last year we were visiting my very best friend in the world who lives up uh who's living at the moment in a remote community called Yili in the Kimberley and uh and you know, it, it was an odd time. I was having to take calls kind of out of the back of the camper trailer wherever we had reception. And we went out for a celebratory dinner in Darwin, um, Erica and I, and we were talking about the cover because I was getting these emails saying, oh, you know, what are your concepts for the cover? And I was like, oh, they never take, they never listen to the author on the cover anyway. It doesn't even matter. But she showed me some pictures on, scrolled through her phone and showed me some pictures on Instagram of this amazing artist, Daniel Lint. Who, who she followed on Instagram. Anyway, I chucked his name into into an email and then Sandy Cull, who's the incredible designer who who looked, who looked designed the cover, uh, apparently that, that last part of my email dropped off so she never saw it. And as they were coming up with concept, you know, look, re-looking at concepts, um, quite near the end she found the link, looked up Daniel and got in touch with him and they've collaborated on this. So it's so exciting. It's like the dream come true to have um this incredible kind of unique art piece on on the front of the cover and i just look at it constantly i love it i love it too and um i'm very happy to be able to say that um for booktopia customers we're giving away a, a signed print of the cover artwork the original artwork so um awesome. you have to order the book by um september 1st and you need to be have an australian address to deliver to um, there's other terms and conditions on the website, um, but that is just really, really cool. It's um, so cool. Am I, am I allowed to enter this? I guess you could buy your own book from us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you've been signing at home, which I just think is adorable. And you've you've done you've done your own sort of fake Booktopia signing. Oh, uh, we we totally have with my six year old who yep. was very helpful, possibly not as helpful as, as you guys might be, but oh, very helpful. Oh, I think helpful. I'm on par with the six-year-old. <laughs> She's actually done a very, uh, very special, I had to bribe her somehow, so I didn't tell um, you folk up at Booktopia in advance, but she has signed one very special coffee with her name and a smiley face, obviously. Uh, so that's going out to someone as well. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um uh, this has been a joy, Kate. Um, can you talk a little tiny bit about what you're working on next? Oh, my goodness. What or do you want to just that? hold your cards? Well, you know what? I, I'll, <laughs> I'll give some hints away because I'm currently uh, in my writing studio, which thankfully was, was finished being built just before COVID. So I've had a place to retreat to. And up on the wall next to me, I've got pictures of um, a slaughter room in a meatworks in the 1930s, uh, Marlon Brando and uh, oh, what else can I tell you? And a, a picture of a half naked man with a, a lamb slung across his body. So I don't know if that gives you any hints, but, but that's what my world is right now. Is it erotic fiction? <laughs> <laughs> it is not erotic fiction. Do not let that go out. I will, Simon and Schuster won't have me anymore. <laughs> I love it. I'm very excited for it. And I'm really excited for readers to to read The Mother Fault. It's it's such a powerful book and you should be very happy with it. Um, I'm sure you so. are. You've got the mask to prove. Oh, I've got the mask, exactly. I can do anything now. I can even, you know, go outside in Melbourne oh, one day. Kate, thanks for being on the Booktobia podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Ben. The Mother Fault is published by Simon & Schuster. You can buy it and any of the books we've mentioned on booktopia.com.au right now.
Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces, and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast, and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, Australia's local bookstore, at booktopia.com.au.